Well, today we are starting a deep dive in our study through Matthew. We're we're diving deeply into the Sermon on the Mount, which is the the longest and most famous sermon of Jesus. Um, It's a sermon that spans three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Uh, It's maybe the most famous section of Scripture, but also possibly one of the least understood sections of Scripture. And if you read through these chapters, which I would encourage you to do a bunch of times over the next few months as we kind of park in this sermon between now and Easter, um, I would encourage you as as you read through to try to study, to memorize, to meditate on the truths that are here. But as you go through, you'll see why this sermon is so, has so many misunderstandings about it. Because you're going to see in this sermon what sound to be impossible standards. Uh, One commentator said that this is the most amount of guilt in the fewest number of chapters in all of the Bible, um, because there there are so many commands and such a high standard packed into just these few chapters. And the commands that Jesus gives in this sermon are harder to keep than the seemingly impossible to keep Old Testament law. We might have thought that Jesus would come onto the scene, loosen up all those Old Testament constraints. Um, But then we go to this sermon and we see him say things like Matthew 5, 43, where he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that doesn't lower the bar at all from the Old Testament. In fact, it makes it way higher. In fact, Jesus will say in the sermon that that's what he's doing. In Matthew 5, 19, he says, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus isn't coming to relax the standards. And maybe we thought that this age of grace that we live in, we're we're on the other side of the cross now, so we must be living in this age where it doesn't really matter how we live. But Jesus even says this, Matthew 5, 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And then there are commands about the inner life that seem almost impossible for us to keep. Matthew 6, 34, he says, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Matthew 6, 15, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So we're commanded to forgive and to not be anxious. And the Old Testament law mainly, though not exclusively, made commandments about external behavior. Like that's how it seemed. Like whatever was going on on the inside, as long as you were doing what was right on the outside, you would obey nine out of 10 of the Old Testament laws. But Jesus comes along and he doesn't relax those commands for the Old Testament. Uh, He doesn't relax the Old Testament commands, but he actually starts to make commands about our hearts and about our inner life. And that's why some of this can seem so confusing because we read this and we think, are we really called to live this way? So how are we supposed to interpret this Sermon on the Mount where where he takes the law of God and applies it all the way down to our hearts? So some people have read this sermon and thought, "Well, well, there's one use of this sermon and here's how this works. God gives all of these impossible commands so that when we read them, we start to despair. We despair because of our utter inability to keep these commands. And in response to that, we go running to Jesus for salvation. And so this sermon is essentially a tool that God uses to make us aware of our great sinfulness and desperate for the salvation that only Jesus can give us. But certainly in giving these commands, Jesus never would have expected us to do anything close to obeying them. They just kind of show us how holy God is. They show us how much we've fallen short so that in response to that, we we run to Jesus for forgiveness. And now that's not totally wrong. In fact, that's the main use of the commands of God to show us our sin, to create a desperation in us so that, that we know that we need a savior so we know we can't save ourselves. Scripture even says that the law of God is like a strict schoolmaster that points us to Jesus And and so that probably is the most important use of this sermon, to send us running to Jesus for mercy. I mean, none of us have perfectly kept the commands in the Sermon on the Mount. We're not going to read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and say, all right, well, I feel like I'm pretty much done with that. Um, I'm doing all those things. And so what's next? What should I do next? We'll read that and we'll recognize I have not lived this. I have fallen short. And so we should see our failures to be holy here, and and we should throw ourselves on the mercy of Jesus. But once we run to Jesus for mercy, does he then say something like, I never expected you to keep those commands anyway? 
Don't worry about the Sermon on the Mount. Don't worry about trying to live that way. I never expected you to. So is the Sermon on the Mount just a wild goose chase to, to wear us out and help us to realize our own desperation? Is obedience to the Sermon on the Mount something that we should be chasing at all? Or is it just to show us our guilt to send us running to Jesus? Or is, it, or is there more than that? Well, if the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount was only to show us our guilt, then how would we make sense of a passage like this? This is Matthew 7, verse 24 in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the wind blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. So if you hear these words and do them, you're a wise person who's building your house on the rock. If you hear these words and don't do them, you're foolish and building your house on the sand. So we are supposed to hear and do. In fact, throughout the New Testament, we see the principle repeated that those people who believe do. If you believe in Jesus for forgiveness and salvation, then the response to that belief is building your house on the rock, which is hearing the words of Jesus and doing them. Because if we believe the gospel, that God loved us so much that he sent his only son to die for us, if we believe that he's that good and kind to us, then we also have to believe that a God who's that good and kind doesn't cease to be good and kind when he starts to talk and to tell us what to do. In fact, we have to believe that those commands are good as well. The God who sent his son to die for us is the same God who commands us. And so we can believe just as his son coming to die was for our good, we can also believe that when he tells us to do something, that's for our good as well. If he proves at the cross how good and loving and kind he is, then we can't look at his commands and just assume, well, those are oppressive. Those are too old fashioned. That standard isn't good. It's not good for me. Not in my case. I'm kind of the asterisk. I'm the exception. God didn't really know what he was talking about. Or we've gotten more sophisticated now and we've come up with a better way. We can't look at the way he tells us to live and say, well, I'm glad I don't have to do that. We're actually warned in scripture that the people who believe the gospel are transformed by the gospel. Otherwise, they don't really believe it. So how do we interpret this sermon? We'll read the sermon. We'll see the ways that we've fallen short. And so certainly the first thing we should do with that is go running to Jesus and confess, I haven't obeyed your commands. I need your mercy. I need your grace. We confess our sin to him. We rekindle our thankfulness for his cross. We feel the burden of our failures lifted because Jesus perfectly kept all these commands in our behalf. And then experiencing his mercy and kindness we also know that the way that he called us to live is good and good for us, and we walk in those ways. We say, okay, but the standard is so high. Will we really obey that? Well, as human beings, we will never have perfect obedience to any of the commands of God because the commands apply all the way down to the heart level. And you'll see that in this sermon. Jesus will say things like, you've heard that it's been said, don't commit adultery. But I'm telling you that if you lust, you've already committed adultery because the, the law actually applies all the way down to the heart. And so nobody reads the Sermon on the Mount and says, I have perfect obedience. But that doesn't mean that we won't have true obedience. The Christian way of life is characterized by real and genuine obedience to Jesus. Not perfect obedience, but certainly true obedience. So you won't read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 and say, I've perfectly obeyed this, but this is the Christian way of life. Christian, Christians can truly be living the way that this sermon describes. And certainly that starts with a humility and a recognition of our need, which we'll see in the beginning of this sermon today. But we go on and, and we live a life very imperfectly of true obedience to these things that Jesus has called us to. And we know that this is how it works. I mean, you, you probably know somebody about whom you would say, she is such an honest person, which is absolutely true, but you also know that she's lied before. 
And, and the fact that she's lied before means that she's not a perfectly honest person, of course. But it doesn't mean that she's not truly honest. You can be truly honest without being perfectly honest. And if that kind of thing weren't the case, then we could never praise anybody for any virtue that we see in them. So you say to someone, you are so hardworking. No, that's not true. Once I slept through my alarm 10 years ago, um, I, I am not perfectly hardworking, therefore I'm not hardworking at all. You're so patient. Mm, six years ago, I yelled at my dog. Um, so I am not uh, a patient person. Well, it's true that we fall short of perfection, but it doesn't mean that we don't have true obedience in those categories because we can. And so, so people who obey the Sermon on the Mount truly have certainly fallen short of obeying it perfectly, but Christians can live this way. Again, not perfectly, but truly. Because coming to believe in Jesus has an effect on us. That's not just something we do to check a box and say, yes, I'm assenting to these truths. True faith is more than just assent to truths. It, it's really hanging our hearts and our lives on Jesus Christ and, and what he did for us on the cross. And when that happens, it's a miracle of God. We're raised from the dead spiritually. The scripture describes that as being born again from above. We're born anew when we believe. When we come to believe there are new appetites, there's new power, we're made a new creation when we believe. There's a new sensitivity to sin. There's new joy that comes from being obedient. We have a new way of thinking about Jesus and his goodness that makes us believe that his commands are good. We have his Holy Spirit living and dwelling within us to convict us of sin, but then being active in our lives to give us the power for true obedience. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so if the Spirit is in us, as he is in all Christians, there is self-control that can be manifested in our lives. So as we read this, we run to Jesus and we strive for true obedience to these things. Sometimes we're really quick to just say, well, I'm not Jesus, I'm, I'm just a sinner, so I'm not gonna obey this anyways. And then we give no effort to it. But that's a totally sub-Christian way to live. Christians for 2,000 years have made efforts to obey Jesus. They fall short of his perfection, but they truly obey. Christians do live differently. In fact, that's a major theme of this sermon. It's largely about the distinct Christian way of life that sets Christians apart from those who don't believe. Jesus says things again and again, like in, in Matthew 6, 8, where he says, do not be like them. He instructs us not to be like the pagans who don't believe in Jesus. He instructs us not to be like the religious hypocrites who do everything that they do for show. The citizens of the kingdom of heaven who are under the rule of Jesus make up a unique counterculture. And when we talk about Christianity being a counterculture, we usually are thinking about all the wrong things, that we sort of wear distinct Christian t-shirts, we listen to distinct Christian music, we play in distinctly Christian sports leagues, we kind of do our alt version of everything that the culture does. And those things are all fine, they're just not essential and they're not the things that are supposed to set us apart as a counterculture. But what truly sets us apart is the way of life that's described in this sermon. Obeying this does make us unique people and it makes us together a unique people. The Sermon on the Mount describes the Christian counterculture and the distinct lives that we live and the distinct ways that we relate to one another in the midst of a world that we would expect because they have different gods to be functioning very different than we function. So, so with that intro, let's just kind of scratch the surface today. To set the stage for this sermon, if you go back a few verses, Jesus has called his first disciples. Um, it, to rewind a bit from chapter 5 and chapter 4, verse 23, it says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So Jesus goes out and he starts declaring the good news of his kingdom. 
the good news that the king has come and to show what the kingdom of God is like in heaven, to show that on earth, he starts to do some of the things on earth as they are in heaven. He, he heals diseases, he casts out demons, he heals untreatable conditions and the crowds start to follow. So the kingdom has come near, people are joining that kingdom and so, so you have to wonder, what's this going to be like? What is this kingdom going to be like that we're part of? And so Matthew 5.1, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So this is kind of the moment. The moment where the king is going to make his inaugural address. He's going to tell them what life will be like in his kingdom. He's going to tell them who this kingdom belongs to. What's it going to be like when he rules and reigns? And so Matthew 5, 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the first word out of his mouth is blessed. And this is significant because the last word in the Old Testament, which, which came before 400 years of silence from God, was curse. God met with Moses back in the Old Testament on a mountain and he gave him a great law, but they broke it. And so that law wound up cursing everybody and sort of deemed everybody a lawbreaker. Remember Moses went up on Mount Sinai, there was rumbling, there was fire, there was smoke. God gave a perfect law. And in that law, he said, these are your blessings for obedience. This is the curse for disobedience. And so Moses brought it down. They had already broken that law. So they were already disobedient, already cursed. And then at the end of the Old Testament, that word curse just echoed for 400 years in God's silence. And now here's God in the flesh. He walks up a mountain and he breaks his silence by pronouncing not a curse, but a blessing. He's come to bring good news. So what does this word blessed mean? Some of your translations say happy, but, but happy doesn't go far enough. It's, it's true, that's a true translation, but it probably just doesn't say the fullness of what that word means. Fundamentally, this word blessed means approved by God or happy because you're approved by God. And so we should want this. And there's no greater approval than the approval of God. People can approve of you, but we know that their approval is fleeting. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Or they approve of you, and you just kind of know that they don't know the whole you. And you kind of have this sense that if they get too close, they're not going to approve of me anymore. That if they knew the true me and not the me that I'm projecting, I wouldn't have their approval. So it just kind of feels very hollow. So, so we want this approval, but it doesn't mean much when we get it from people. So what would it be to have approval from God? God, who is the fair and honest judge, who knows our hearts, and then puts a stamp of approval on us. Like, what else do we need? So what does it take for us to get God's approval? We know what it takes to get people's approval. We achieve something. We gain something. We have something. We know how to get their blessings, but how do we get the blessing that really matters? How do we get that approval from God? How do we get God to call us blessed? What resume is he looking for? Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So God approves of the poor in spirit. And poor and blessed are not two words that we would typically use to describe the same person. A couple of years ago when hashtag blessed was the rage on the internet, the people weren't posting pictures of their poverty. They were posting pictures of the new car that they bought, the new house that they bought, the food they were eating, the vacation they were on, hashtag blessed. Blessing comes as a material gift from God. But here he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So what is it to be poor in spirit? We might read that and we might think, well, that probably means just sort of mopey just kind of beaten down by life, you're, you're lacking life, lacking vitality, you're lacking courage, you're just kind of a beat down moper. But remember that Jesus is the only one who perfectly obeyed all of the Sermon on the Mount. Any of the characteristics that he's calling us to here um, are characteristics that we can see in him. And we don't see in Jesus beat down mopiness. We certainly see his sorrow at times, but you also see in Jesus a boldness and a courage and a vigor. There's no self-pity in Jesus. There's no whininess. 
So poor in spirit can't mean mopey. So what does it mean? Well, if you're poor financially, you recognize that you have nothing. And in their day, if you wanted to survive and you were poor financially, you weren't working, the only thing that you had left to do was beg. You didn't have anything to offer people. You had no way to pay them back. You just sat out as an open-handed beggar with nothing to give, completely dependent on their mercy for your physical survival. And he says, likewise, someone who is poor in spirit recognizes that morally he or she is completely bankrupt. That we're incapable of offering God anything. And this is not self-hatred. It's not a false humility. It's a deep form of repentance that comes from realizing how far we have fallen short of the perfect obedience that God requires. It's a complete lack of self-righteousness, a complete lack of vanity, a complete lack of any feeling of superiority or pride. It's having nothing to offer God and knowing it. And he says, these poor people in spirit, they have the kingdom. Which is so strange because the kingdoms in this world, they belong to the strong, they belong to the proud, they belong to the victorious. But this kingdom of God is so different. It belongs to those who don't have their own moral perfection. It belongs to people who come to God empty with nothing to, to leverage him with, with nothing to offer. And Jesus says, if that's where you start, then you have the kingdom. And this is so different than the religious message that says, we're going to do good things to get God to accept us. You know, as much over the next few months as we want to Bring out, bring out the ways that we want to strive to obey the Sermon on the Mount, we never, ever strive to obey to get God's acceptance. When Jesus went to that cross on Calvary, he died to pay the price for all of our sins. And he says, whoever believes in him doesn't perish, but has everlasting life. And so the way that we get accepted by God is we get that alien righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus imparted to us when we believe. And then God accepts us because he accepts his son. And when we come to believe in Jesus, we're completely wrapped in his son. So there are good reasons for obedience, but we don't obey because we're trying to get something out of God. We're not trying to put God in our debt. We're not trying to earn our acceptance. In fact, there is no coming to God genuinely if we think that he owes us something. We never think that our good works merit God's acceptance. So repentance and humility, those are the door to the kingdom of God. Not your own achievements. You can open an awful lot of doors on earth with your own achievements, but you cannot open the door to the kingdom with the things that you do. The first characteristic of a citizen of God's kingdom, of a Christian, should be an acknowledgement of our own spiritual poverty and a total dependence on God's grace for our forgiveness. Arrogance and boasting are diametrically opposed to everything Christianity is based on. And also, on the other hand, saying, I've sinned and therefore I could never truly know God, that misses the, the fundamental message of Christianity altogether as well. Because it's only those who know that they've sinned and acknowledge that they've sinned who can know God. So he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the next characteristic of kingdom people is mourning. Matthew 5, 4, he says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And this is a verse that we'll read at funerals a lot as a comfort. Um, and it's you know, read as a promise that you're mourning now, but one day you will be comforted by God. And it's true that God comforts the lowly. It's true that when Jesus returns, he's gonna wipe away every tear. He's gonna take away all sorrow. There'll be no more sin, no more death. There will be no more mourning. It, it's true that though we mourn as we go through this life, one day we will be comforted when the Lord returns. But these beatitudes, these pronouncements of blessings actually build on each other. And so, so the mourning specifically in view here builds on being poor in spirit. So it's not necessarily the mourning of, of a loss of someone that has died, but it's a personal grief over our sin. It's like the emotion that comes with that poverty in spirit. So the word of God comes to us and it shows us plainly how sinful we are, 
And then in response, our spirit is grieved. So if you recognize that you've got nothing to offer God and, and you're grieved over how you've lived, if you feel that brokenness that your sin has created, and then if you're not trying to talk your way out of it or manipulate your way out of it or spin it or gloss over it, then that one who was dead and is alive comes to us and instead of the death sentence that we deserve, he embraces us. He paid for our sin at the cross and he comforts us. And that's the gospel. That's the core of what we believe. That, that's what our kingdom is built on, that poverty in spirit and mourning and then being comforted only by Christ. Verse five, he says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Sometimes we think of a meek person and we think timid or wishy-washy or kind of like a mousy person. But again, we look to Jesus for our example. He wasn't that way at all. Sometimes we think someone who's meek is just, just nice and easygoing all the time. Some people have that naturally and, and some don't. This word meekness is used in the Old Testament to describe Moses. Numbers 12, three, it says, now the man Moses was very meek, more than all people who were on the face of the earth. And in that chapter, what was going on is that Miriam and Aaron were challenging Moses' leadership and his place as the messenger of God that God had said that he was. And Moses, in that context, he doesn't defend himself, and that's because he was meek. He wasn't full of himself. He wasn't concerned with his own interests. He just trusted the Lord. He basically took those false accusations on himself, and rather than avenge himself, he trusted the Lord. And then the Lord stepped in and defended him. So if that's a description of what meekness is, meekness is a humility toward God and toward other people. It's when you have the right or the power to do something, but you hold back for the benefit of someone else because you trust God. And because you're humble and you don't see yourself as the most important player in, in all the games that you're in. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that the man who is truly meek is the one who is amazed that God and man can think of him as well as they do and treat him as well as they do. A contrast to this, this with the way that we often live, we, we can often be so ego-driven. We can often be out to defend our own reputations, to defend our rights, to justify ourselves, to clear our name, to avenge the wrongs that were done against us. But if we're poor in spirit, it's hard to be all about ourselves. The poor in spirit can't assume that I deserve something. I deserve a better marriage. I deserve a better job. I deserve a better car. I deserve better. If we're really poor in spirit, we don't try to get our piece of the pie by fighting and boasting and working to advance only ourselves. Jesus says it's the meek who inherit the earth. So life in this kingdom together is very different. The citizens of this kingdom are more about advancing the interests of others than they are advancing their own interests. They're more about making much of Jesus and making much of others than they are about making much of themselves. They're about taking on the sacrifices that it takes to help others, even though it could mean less for them. Galatians 6.2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And if we're gonna live that way, if we're gonna bear one another's burdens, that means that we share part of the weight. So to really be meek in this way is hard. It, it is to put others before yourselves. Um, and and it, when we do that, it's a, a costly thing. You know, often we'll see someone else who's struggling with something or, or, or needs help with something. And we'll say, well, I can't, afford to help, I can't afford to give, I'm not able to help, which is sometimes true, but sometimes what we're really saying is, I can't afford to help without it costing me something. And if I help her, I won't be able to do all the fun things I had planned on doing. If I give with this huge, to meet this huge need, I won't be able to drive the car that I wanted to drive. I can't help without it affecting my fun. But bearing a burden always involves sharing a weight and some personal sacrifice for the good of others. Back during the Black Plague, people 
were infected and they were thrown out in the streets because nobody wanted to risk keeping them in their house. So these are people who are alive, but they treated them like they were dead. They threw them outside because their kids could get sick and die. They could get sick and die. It could cost them their lives. So they had to push them away. But meek Christians came along and they were the ones who were taking people in during the Black Plague. And often it did cost them their lives. Often they did get sick. But they knew that the meek one day will inherit the earth anyways. Life in the kingdom looks something like that. A life of radical sacrifice for one another, costly sacrifice for one another, but a gladness as we make that sacrifice because we know any sacrifice we make isn't permanent. The meek will inherit the earth. In verse six, he says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. You know, it's one thing to kind of recognize that we've sinned and we've made a mess of things and we don't like how our life has gone. We can be really sorry that we got caught, sorry that we made a mess of relationships, but it's all a little bit hollow when we're still okay with staying in a way of life that's fundamentally selfish. Jesus says that blessed people not only recognize their own sin and mourn over their own sin, but they have a driving hunger and thirst for righteousness. And throughout Matthew's writing, righteousness is a pattern of life that conforms with God's will or what we might call practical holiness. That it's not just that we're sorry over our sin, but we want to live the righteous lives that God has called us to. And we want it like we want food. We want it like we, like, like we want drink. That We hunger and we thirst for it. So God approves of people who recognize how bankrupt they are spiritually on their own and who are hungry and thirsty to conform their lives to God's ways. Who have a longing for righteousness like they have a hunger for food. So citizens of the kingdom care when our lives look like they are so far from being conformed to the pattern that Jesus gives to us in the Sermon on the Mount. They're hungry for something more. They don't pretend they have it all together. They're poor in spirit. But they're hunger, hungry for a very different life. And that, that emptiness, that poverty of spirit, that meekness, that mourning over sin, that hunger for a better life, that's the door to the kingdom of God. Because if we will say what God says about our sin, it's only then that we can start to be filled with the righteousness of Jesus and only then that we can start to live a life that never perfectly truly conforms to the ways of Jesus. And that's what we're called to and that's what we'll be after as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount in the months ahead.